In this video, we're going to discuss the three systems of memory. But before we do, I want to describe how psychologists categorize these three systems of memory. There's two main dimensions along which these systems of memory differ, and this determines how we categorize them. So first of all, the memory systems differ in their memory span, which simply refers to how much information that particular uh, memory system can hold. And second of all, we have memory du duration, which simply refers to how long the memory system can hold that information. So here are the three systems of memory, sensory memory, short-term memory, and long-term memory. I'll note that you probably have seen some of these before, specifically short-term and long-term memory, but what I will say is that the way these terms are used in everyday life is actually really incorrect, and we'll get into that very soon. What you think is short-term memory and long-term memory probably isn't exactly what you think it is. Sensory memory is probably a new one, and we're going to dive into all of this, but first I want to just describe at sort of a bird's-eye level what the process looks like, because there's a sequence, a flow to your memory. It all starts by sensing or perceiving something from the outside world. So you feel something, right? Touch, perception. You see something, vision. Maybe you hear something, hearing, smell something, etc. You take that information from the outside world into your brain. That is going into your sensory memory. This is a brief form of memory all about perceptual information. And again, we'll get into this very soon. That sensory information then gets passed on to short-term memory. Now, short-term memory is where information either goes to die or goes to get stored in long-term memory. And the difference is sort of dependent on whether you rehearse that information. Think about remembering a phone number of someone you just met, for example, right? Chances are you're just repeating that phone number over and over and over just long enough to get to a pen and paper or something for you to write down that phone number. And then probably after you write down that phone number, the information is entirely lost. It doesn't go to long-term memory. The only way it goes to long-term memory is if you specifically try and remember it. If you rehearse and practice that information, then it gets sent to long-term memory. And you'll notice that this is a double arrow here between short and long-term memory, just to reflect the idea that not only does information go from short-term to long-term memory, but you can also access memory from your long-term uh, sort of memory and then bring it into your short-term memory for you to work with. If, for example, I asked you to recall your favorite birthday of all time, right, you could probably think of something that's accessing the information from your long-term memory and then bringing it back to your short-term memory. So here's where things get slightly dicey. Within these different systems of memory are subsystems. All of them except short-term memory have subsystems. The good news is these different forms of memory are all very straightforward, easy to understand. I can just give you a quick definition of each and you'll get the idea, some of which we've already learned about before, by the way, like habituation and classical conditioning, part of long-term memory, as you can see here. Now we're going to get into each in turn, and I'm going to color these just to help it a little bit, uh, make it a little bit easier for you to parse out this information. So anything green relates to sensory memory, anything yellow is short-term memory, and anything red relates to long-term memory. So we're going to start by talking specifically about sensory memory and ignoring everything else, at least to start. So as I said before, sensory memory is memory for perceptual information, information about what you can see, hear, and smell, and so on from the outside world. And this is the memory system in which memory is stored very briefly, we'll talk about the duration very soon, before being passed on to short-term memory. And the best way to understand sensory memory is to go through the examples of uh, the two sub sort of systems within sensory memory, starting with iconic memory. Iconic memory is sensory memory, so it's part of that system, for vision. Think icon, right? Iconic, icon. It's a visual memory. It lasts only about one second, right? A thousand milliseconds, so again, very brief, short duration. And this allows you to take sort of a mental screenshot of what you just saw. It allows you to hold an image in your mind ever so briefly and then pass that image on to short-term memory. So let's do a quick demonstration. If you're taking notes or looking elsewhere, this is where you'll want to look up at the screen because I'm going to flash an image on the screen for a very short duration, just about 100 milliseconds, excuse me, one-tenth of a second, and your job is to simply tell me what you saw. Ready? Here we go. All right, did you catch it? What is it? I'll do it one more time in case you missed it. Here we go. Okay, 
If you, if you have a good iconic memory, you may have seen a beach. This was the image you saw. Now, your ability to do that is, again, dependent on your iconic memory. Without your iconic memory, you wouldn't be able to um, hold that picture in your mind after just seeing it for a tenth of a second. Next, we have echoic memory. For echoic, think echo. Echoic memory is sensory memory for hearing that lasts between 5 and 10 seconds, so a slightly longer dur duration than iconic memory, and it allows you to sort of play audio back after hearing it. Echoic memory is really useful. It allows you to do all sorts of things. For example, take notes on what I'm saying. If you are taking notes, chances are you can't keep up with my rate of speaking, right? I probably on to the next sentence before you've even written down the sentence you just heard. But your ability to continue writing down that sentence, even though I've moved on, is thanks to your echoic memory. You can sort of play back a little audio clip of what you just heard. That's your echoic memory. Okay, so that's your sensory memory. I told you, pretty simple. On to short-term memory. And here's where we debunk some ways of thinking in general society about short-term memory that are simply not accurate. So short-term memory is uh, basically um, a memory system containing information that's from your sensory memory. And this is sort of a maintenance uh, memory system. Information gets maintained here for a short period of time. And look at this, typically between 10 and 20 seconds. Now, this is where we see a mistake in general society. A lot of people use the, the words short-term memory to refer to memory of, you know, what they ate for breakfast or wh what they did last night, what they ate for dinner last night, where they went last night. That's all long-term memory. In fact, if you remember anything of what we talked about at the beginning of this video, if you remember anything about sensory memory, that information is already in your long-term memory. That's not your short-term memory. It's been longer than 20 seconds, so it's in your long-term memory. So again, short-term memory really is short-term, 10 to 20 seconds, just enough time for you to work with some information. So let's do a quick demonstration to test your short-term memory span. We already talked about the duration, right? 10 to 20 seconds. Now let's talk about the span. This is a really simple task. I'm simply going to show you some letters on the screen. I'll read them aloud and then I'll flip them away. And your job is to uh, read them aloud back to me as if I were with you and, and I could hear, right? Or write them down or whatever you want to do. But test yourself. See if you can remember the different uh, letters. Excuse me, I'm going to put up a certain amount of letters. See if you can remember those letters. So here we go. K, X, W, E. All right, what were the letters? K, X, W, E. Very good. I'm assuming you got that one. Most people do. That one should be relatively easy. But what we're going to do now is start to increase the length, increase the span to really test how much information you can hold in your short-term memory. Here's the next one. J, M, U, R, Q. Okay, what were the letters? And again, if you need to pause the video, Feel free to do so after each one if you are writing down or something, because I'm going to give it away pretty quickly, just for the sake of keeping the video relatively brief. Uh, the letters were J-M-U-R-Q. Great job if you got that one. Let's keep going. L-B-T-X-A-C. What were the letters? L-B-T-X-A-C. All right, we're getting a little bit harder here. Let's do another one. I-A-G-M-H-P-E. What were the letters? I-A-G-M-H-P-E. Okay, so how did you do so far, right? Did you do pretty good on these? Uh, you can kind of assess yourself. Now let's do a crazy one. U-B-H-R-G-F-E-Q-Z-T-R-Q-Z-S-P. All right, what were the letters? Okay, I'm not even going to read them because chances are it was impossible, right? For you and for everyone I've ever done this demonstration with in live classes and whatever, no one's able to get this, right? They can get the first few letters, maybe the last couple, but in general, it's very, very hard. And this is an illustration, this quick demonstration of the magic number. The magic number is a description of the span of short-term memory, which is about seven plus or minus two bits of information. So the magic number is 7 plus or minus 2, meaning most people, the vast majority of people, can hold between 5 and 9 bits of information. So the first one we did only, only had 4 bits of information, 4 letters. So that was probably very easy, right? Then we got to 5, 6, 7, okay? You probably did decent on that. The very last one had 15 bits of information. So it was well beyond the magic number, which... Uh, which means unless you're someone with a truly exceptional short-term memory span, that was basically impossible to you. 
but there are ways you can get around this magic number. One technique is called chunking. Chunking is a technique in which we can increase short-term memory span by grouping together bits of information into chunks, therefore sort of decreasing the number of bits of information you have to learn. Here's an example. Let's chunk. Let's do a demonstration similar to before, but I'll make it easy for you to chunk together some information. CIA, USA, FBI, NBC, JFK. Okay, what were the letters? Okay, it should have been quite a bit easier, right? You still have 15 letters here, but we decrease that 15 bits of information into five chunks. CIA, USA, FBI, NBC, and JFK. So instead of having to remember 15 individual letters with no relation to one another, you could, if you were familiar with some of these acronyms, you could learn just five different acronyms, right? USA, United States of America, FBI, and so on, right? Um, so again, chunking is a useful way to remember bits of information, which would normally be beyond your short-term memory span. Okay, that's short-term memory. Let's talk about long-term memory. There's a lot of different systems here, but we're gonna focus on different parts at a time, starting with the right-hand side of long-term memory, the explicit memory, which is then subdivided even further into episodic and semantic memory. Now, I really encourage you to try and learn the structure as I'm showing it to you here. If you try and learn all of these different terms in isolation, it's gonna be really hard to remember Semantic memory, was that part of impl implicit memory or short-term memory or what? Where was that? So try and really remember this structure. It will help you, I promise. But we're going to talk about explicit memory. So explicit memory is a form of long-term memory that we're outwardly aware of. We can recall it. It's explicit. It's also called declarative memory versus non-declarative memory, which is another name for implicit memory. Explicit memory is called declarative memory because we can declare it. We can tell people about it, right? It's specific things that we can, we're, we're aware of and we can communicate to other people. So again, explicit memory is further divided into two different types of explicit memory, starting with semantic memory. Semantic means meaning. So semantic memory is knowledge of facts about the world, especially facts that are stored linguistically, meaning in terms of language, as a sentence in your brain, okay? So semantic memory is knowledge of facts that are stored linguistically, especially about the world. For example, if I were to ask you, who was the first president of the United States? Or even who's the current president of the United States, right? This is all semantic memory. In contrast, episodic memory is a recollection of one's own life events. So it's your own personal memories about events that have happened in your life. For example, if I were to ask, um, you know, again, what was your favorite birthday party? That's an episode in your life that you can recall. So going to Disneyland on your eighth birthday, for example, might be an episodic memory for you. And again, this is a form of an explicit memory because you can tell me about it. And it's a form of long-term memory because it's been way more than 20 seconds ago. Okay, now let's finish off with implicit memory, which again, some of which we've learned about before, like habituation and classical conditioning, so I won't harp on those too much, but let's get into it. Implicit memory is another form of long-term memory that happens sort of beneath the surface, implicitly, meaning we can't outwardly explain it, we might not even be consciously aware of it in the first place. It's non-declarative. If I were to ask you about an implicit sort of memory, you might not really be able to explain uh, that memory all too well, or you might not even know you have that memory. And there's some great examples of people who, for example, have uh, really severe amnesia, where they've had half their brain removed. I've hinted at some of these stories before, which we'll get into in the future. Um, but they can still have an intact implicit memory. So you can give them tasks in which they build skills over time. And every time they do that task, their short-term memory is gone, right? Long-term memory might be gone. Every time they do that task, they act like it's the first time they've ever seen it, right? They can't recall ever having done that task before. And then you bring them the next day, they do the task again. It's like the first time they've ever done it. And yet, if you do that enough times, you start to see improvement where they end up becoming experts at that task despite having never remembered uh, doing that task in the first place. So this is an example of their explicit memory being totally wiped out, but their implicit memory being intact. 
So there are a few types of implicit memory, habitu uh, habituation, excuse me, and classical conditioning we've talked about before. These are forms of learning which, once learned, become association stored in long-term memory. And these are implicit because you might not even know that you have these associations. You might not know that you've habituated. You might not know that you've been classically conditioned to salivate at the sound of a bell or whatever, and yet that might be taking place. So it's implicit. Next, we have procedural memory. This is memory for how to do things. That is memory for procedures. For example, tying your shoes. Chances are you don't sit down and really think through the mechanics of tying your shoes every time you've done it. Now that you've learned it, it's a part of your implicit memory and your long-term memory. It's a part of your procedural memory in which you just know how to do the procedure, okay? Same with riding a bike. Even if you stopped for 10 years, you can come back and ride the bike. Even if you don't, again, think about every single motion you're doing, you just kind of know how to get on a bike and do it. That's because it's a procedural memory. And there are all sorts of things you might not even think about that fall under this category. Knowing how to drive a car, knowing how to open a doorknob, right? Simple things like that that you don't really have to think about are parts of your procedural memory. And finally, priming. This is a bit of a misnomer. Priming in its truest sense is the ability to identify a stimulus more quickly once we've seen similar stimuli. And again, it's implicit because you might not even know this is happening. Psychologists have taken this idea of priming and they've adopted it into all sorts of different studies. For example, we can post pictures of smiling people on a wall or in an experiment between subjects in a different condition, pictures of, you know, frowning people on the wall. And we can see if we can prime people to be happier or less happy and see what changes on behavior that happens. So that's an example of priming in sort of a different application. But in any case, I want to finish off the video with one last demonstration to illustrate an interesting sort of feature, uh, an interesting way that our long-term memory works. For this demonstration, I'm going to post some words on the slide. I'll let you look at them this time, and I'll read them aloud. And I, I just want you to, to try and remember as many of these words as you can. So after I get through reading them, I'll ask you, I'll, I'll kind of put them away and I'll ask you to pause the video and write down on a piece of paper or a note or a Word document or whatever as many of the words as you can. And try and participate because you might find some interesting things about what you can remember. So here are the words. Ball, shoe, tree, dog, paper, bird, house, sky, desk, car, rope, dress, xylophone, knife, store, pencil, grass, man, cloud, hat, and vase. Okay, so at this point, I want you to pause the video and write down as many words as you can remember. And I'll take a five or 10 second pause here just to be safe, but I really want you to try your best. Write down as many as you can remember because I'm gonna show you something kinda cool. All right, I'm gonna jump back into it. So if you uh, haven't yet paused the video and written down your words, please do so. But if not, I'm gonna show you the words here. All right, how'd you do? If you're like most people, you probably did great on the first few words, the last few words, and a couple of the oddball words like xylophone and knife. Xylophone because it's a word you don't hear too often and it begins with some weird letters and knife because it's emotionally charged. This is an example or an illustration of primacy and recency. Primacy and recency refer to the idea or the phenomenon in which when remembering a list, people tend to remember the first items, which is primacy, prime, beginning, and the last items, recency, the most recent items, the best. This is why, for example, when uh, paying for commercials, right, uh, for example, on Super Bowl Sunday, uh, commercials pay much more to be placed at the beginning or the end of a commercial break rather than in the middle. Because they know, based on psychological research, that if your commercial is in the middle, it kind of gets lost among all the other commercials. But if it's at the beginning or end, people tend to remember it more. 
Now you'll notice if you watch Super Bowl Sunday and look at the commercials, the commercials that are in the in, in the middle try and be really weird. They try and you know really be memorable in some sort of a way. There's a commercial I can't forget, for example, from years ago on a Super Bowl Sunday, uh, the Puppy Monkey Baby commercial. Puppy Monkey Baby, I can't forget it, right? It's just in my head. It was in the middle of a bunch of different commercials, but it was such an oddball that I remembered it. And those are all of your different systems of memory.